love you. <laughs> what was that, man? Project, boy, project! You are not in a cupboard, you are on the stage! In this video, I'm gonna talk about Ni no Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom. Stay with me on this one because this is a doozy and I am not talking about the title. Picture this, you are on your way to an international summit when a nuclear blast transports you into the bedroom of a young cat boy destined to be the ruler of a kingdom named Ding Dong Dell. If I stop right here, I get arrested for existing under the influence of crack cocaine. Right here, on the spot, in front of God and everybody. This plotline, even with context, is the sort of thing that seems to make sense only at one in the morning while tactically surrounding a bottle of vodka or being employed in a Japanese video game development studio, whichever comes first. But let us take a step back and attempt, emphasis on attempt, to look at this with a more objective eye. Your name is Evan Petty Whisker Tildrum. Your father is dead, your father was the king, the second-in-command has a problem with you, and the second-in-command intends to solve that problem by way of acute steel poisoning with air conditioning. Since you are in no condition to fight against the entire army of your own kingdom, you take the smart option of escaping to greener pastures so as to live another day, while accompanied by that freshly nuked politician I spoke about earlier. Tagging along on your journey will be a cast of colorful characters made up of the President of the fucking United States, the guy who skipped leg like day, Poofy Pigtails Incorporated, Anime Glasses of Justice, Amy Rose, and Lisa Simpson. Together, you will restore peace to the realm, save the day, get the princess, eat the shish kebab, and live happily ever after. That is literally Evan's goal, make a kingdom where everyone lives happily ever after. These are not my words, I am directly quoting the cat boy here. All I am missing is a mode that makes everyone say fuck instead of flip. If I somehow earn the powers of God and make this a reality, this game will give South Park a run for its money. The yellow ball guy will yell fuck every three seconds in all of his Welsh glory. Poofy Pigtails Incorporated will also yell fuck on multiple occasions. It will be amazing, and it will save my brain some processing power, because we all know what the characters mean to say in these times. The game has three modes. Action RPG has you bump against enemies on the world map and then fight them in real time. This is the bread and butter of the whole game, so you will be swinging a sword and casting spells more often than not. It is worthy to note that if you are grossly overleveled compared to your opponent, it will not initiate the fight unless you do, which can help to streamline travel within familiar areas. Since this represents the core of the game, it does not have an explicit name per se, so it is probably best to name this mode Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom. Skirmish has you control a small army around the world map against opposing squadrons. It is portrayed as the strategic element, but there is no challenge beyond remembering the rock-paper-scissors relationships of the squadron types, and you can literally brute force your way through this mode without penalty. You must do a few skirmishes to advance the main plotline, but the beauty is that if you fail one, you can still keep whatever experience you earned, so you can just throw your army at the same encounter until it becomes strong enough to mindlessly barrel through the opposition. Kingdom Management is a semi-idle game in which you have your citizens gather resources and perform research to unlock new equipment, new spells, and new perks to aid in your adventure. Most of the time, all you need to do is to make an occasional pass to collect your stack of crafting materials and reassign your citizens around so that your research can keep chugging along, which progresses in real time as long as the game remains open. Whether you leave your kingdom running while you advance the plotline, or do so while getting up from your chair and doing house chores, is entirely up to you. It does not really matter what you do to increase your power, as long as you partake in one or two main lines of activities. You can level up your spells, you can craft better weapons, you can do all that utility research. 
you can bust through all the side quests for stacks of easy experience, and whoever is not active in your party remains usable since they will never be more than a level behind versus your active members. In fact, switching people in and out of active duty is doable pretty much any time without having to bring anybody up to speed. On top of that, you can choose to control whichever character you desire at any time. I chose to play Evan most of the time, since the bulk of the story is from his perspective. This all leaves enough content to consume over something like 60 hours, and that is if you speed read the dialogue. I do not include the DLC in this count, and nobody should, because the DLC is red hot garbage that adds nothing more than hardcore content where it does not belong, and it attempts to turn into Dark Souls a game that has nowhere near the precision or credentials to handle this elegantly. This is a game where the player is expected to mash the attack buttons until everything on screen has been pancaked. Nothing more. If you really want to deliver an extra dose of fuck you, you can always shoot a few magic spells to keep things interesting. You have your little army of Studio Ghibli squeaky toys who can do some special attacks on their own schedule, and if all else fails, you can always just run away from the monster and let your AI party members handle the fight. You actually have to do this more often than not, because the enemies have a tendency to entertain a hyperfixation on you with an intensity that borders on foot fetishism. It is a legitimate strategy to kite the monster all around the battle area while your party members do all the fun work. If you have the extreme misfortune of getting caught, you will get helplessly juggled from full health to zero with no way to respond except by hitting the start button so you can swallow a healing item while you are in the process of getting topped with extreme prejudice. Makes perfect sense. It gets worse when you realize that the collision detection is about as stable as a Hollywood marriage and all of the game mechanic tiebreakers favor the enemy instead of you. If the game is not certain as to whether or not you dodged properly, it will happily assume that you are the one who fucked up. If both of your party members are dead, you use a revival item, and you get struck by a killing blow before the revival animation is over, the game considers that your party has been wiped out. That or it quite simply crashes to desktop. The crashes are only a mild annoyance since most of the time the game auto-saves every time something interesting happens, so it is rare that you lose any more than 5 minutes. The problems start happening with the DLC dungeons, since you cannot save while you are inside of them, and the game incidentally turns the fuck you setting to 11. The worst case scenario is that you can lose a full hour of progress for absolutely bullshit reasons. Your best course of action is to completely ignore the DLCs, leave the difficulty on the default setting, and focus on nothing but the main story and its side quests. If, by some twist of cosmic misfortune, you somehow ended up with the DLC anyway, then most of the DLC quests can be identified by the recommended level being above a hundred. That still does not prevent you from inadvertently starting up one of the quests, which can lead to a few puzzling situations. Let me help you with the biggest one. There is a sky pirate named Cumbitch. He looks like this, and I refuse to pronounce his name any other way. He will wake up one fine day and literally act like a man possessed, before directing you to a shrine north of your home base. You will not be able to get all the citizens for your kingdom until you progress that questline past the first boss fight. Fortunately, despite the quest being marked as level 120, the first boss fight is only level 30 and can be safely dealt with while you are still progressing the main story. You are welcome. Put everything together and it is kind of disjointed. The skirmish mode lives in its own silo and it brings no advancement to you, aside from a couple of plot points and a handful of minor crafting items. The game will interrupt a dialogue to show a short cutscene in which the characters say a couple lines with full voiceover, then get back to text-based dialogue like nothing happened. The storyline is beautiful and full of sugar, as long as you refuse to look anywhere below surface level. 
It is when the push comes to the shove that everything starts breaking apart and all the problems come on up front and center when this could have been avoided oh so easily. Playing casual relegates the problems to the backstage, but any effort to get down and serious will put the spotlight onto them and nothing else and you know you hit that point when you spend most of your time running away from everything inside of a fight. I want to swing my mace into a face, with bonus points for deja vu. It has a lot going for it. It delivers great experiences, most of the time. It is interesting, it is fun, it catches you by surprise and it makes you laugh. As long as you do not stress it too hard, it will be a great way to spend long hours getting pleasantly lost and not caring about anything. You can put up with the issues, even though they are kind of weird, and everything will be fine, and everyone will be happy. But the moment the going gets tough, is the moment when these issues boil to the forefront and transform into an idol to the unreliable. Uh, will you marry me? In short, this game is a functional alcoholic. Uh, 